Do you remember how you first learned about negative exponents, or rational exponents, or even irrational ones? After all, exponentiation was defined as repeated multiplication, wasn't it? How can you, for example, multiply 2 by itself two and a half times? Now, something very similar to exponentiation is the factorial. The classical definition is that n factorial is the product of the first n natural numbers. But similarly to exponentiation, we can extend the domain of the factorial. Something that usually comes up at this point is the gamma function. But we won't use it in this video and instead define the factorial for all integers and half integers. And, more specifically, we're going to see why, of all things, the square root of pi appears in there. First, let me be clear. We are not going to define something which is not widely accepted for half integer factorials. The gamma function can be evaluated at the corresponding values and we will get the same results. So with that out of the way, let me outline what we can do. Originally, the factorial was only defined for natural numbers. This is the domain in which the original definition makes sense after all. But there's one more you often hear about. Zero factorial. We're going to explore what the factorial of integers less than one can be. But first, give it a try yourself. Maybe you already know about zero factorial, but can you see a way in which this makes sense? If you take a look at the pattern the factorial makes when you plug in the first natural numbers, you can see that to get from 1 factorial to 2 factorial, you multiply by 2. To then get to 3 factorial, you multiply by 3. Then by 4, 5 and so on. You can even see this in the definition. But what if we go to the left instead? 0 factorial times 1 will be 1 factorial, which is 1. So 0 factorial should be 1. And, in fact, this is a widely used definition and makes a lot of formulas much easier. Now you might be asking, what is negative 1 factorial then? Or negative 2 factorial? Let's see. Negative 1 factorial times 0 will be 0 factorial, so 1. That's not really possible. So negative 1 factorial is not defined, and likewise negative 2 factorial, negative 3 factorial and so on are not defined either. Now for the fun part. If you're like me, you probably immediately wondered what the factorial of non-integers would be as soon as you've been introduced to the operation in school. But you probably didn't get a satisfying answer either. Maybe someone told you about the gamma function. But all these scary symbols didn't make sense at first. And now, maybe they do make sense, but it's not clear why this should generalize the factorial. And even then, if you evaluate it at 3 halves, which would correspond to 1 half factorial, you get not just pi, no, the square root of pi divided by 2. What is pi doing here? There's gotta be a circle. And, in fact, there is. I want to show it to you, and for that I want you to just forget the gamma function. Two things. I don't want to use the gamma function in this video anymore, and for that I will allow myself to use the factorial notation for half integers as well. It's not exactly a standard notation, but as you can see, this definition will make sense, so I think it will make sense to use this notation here as well. And second, we only really need the half factorial for one number, be it one half or three halves or negative one half. The others will define themselves according to the recursion from earlier. Nevertheless, it will be important to check if our definition fulfills this identity. Okay, enough talking. Let me be your guide in discovering math. At the beginning, there's a circle. This circle has a filled version and an empty one. The filled version is a two-dimensional object embedded in two-dimensional space. You have two degrees of freedom in choosing a point on this disk. This object is therefore called the two-ball, or P2. Its boundary, on the other hand, is, though embedded in two-dimensional space, a one-dimensional object. You only have one degree of freedom in choosing a point on it, the central angle. So this object is called the one-sphere, or S1. Take your time to ensure these definitions do make sense for you, they are quite confusing. One dimension higher up you get the three ball, which is a filled sphere in normal terms. Its boundary is the two sphere, remember you only have two degrees of freedom on it, latitude and longitude. One dimension below, in one dimension space, you get the one ball, and this is just a line through the origin. If it has a radius of r, its endpoints are r and negative r and its boundary are the two zero-dimensional points at the end of the line, the zero-sphere. 
Zero ball is a single point and now sadly it doesn't have a negative one sphere as a boundary. These are the equations that all points on the n spheres and balls satisfy. With that out of the way, we can take a look at the volume and surface area of these balls and spheres. They are dependent on the radius r and we write bn for the volume of the n-ball and sn for the surface area of the n-sphere. You already know some values of these. For example, the area of the circle is b2, which is pi r squared. Its boundary is s1, which is 2 pi r. For the classical sphere, we have its volume at 4 thirds pi r cubed and its surface area is 4 pi r squared. You probably intuitively know that these values of Sn and Bn should be proportional to r to the n, but can you show why? An n-ball can be inscribed inside an n-dimensional hypercube, in two dimensions that would be a square, in three dimensions an ordinary cube and so on. The volume of this hypercube is obviously 2r to the n and the volume of the n-balls is directly proportional to the volume of the cube. For Sn, this will clear swell after the next observation. Next question. How is the surface area of the n-ball, Sn-1, related to its volume, Bn? If you apply a tiny change to the radius r, the volume also grows by a tiny amount. And if we make this change even tinier, we end up at a relative change of volume that is equal to the surface area. So the surface area is in fact the derivative of the volume. Solving this is not a difficult task, as we have shown that the volume is directly proportional to r to the n. If we have some constant times r to the n and differentiate with respect to r, we get a formula on how sn-1 depends on bn. Let's see if we can verify this formula. The volume of the 3 ball is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So the surface area of its boundary, the 2 sphere, must be 4 r squared, and indeed it is. If we now could find a formula for how bn-1 depends on sn, we would have a complete recursion formula. This relation is the key to our ultimate result. Let me explain. Let's start with s2, the sphere embedded in 3D. This is now our left side. Now on the right we have s1, so the circle boundary, and b1, which is the line. We'll only take a look at the specific case in which the radius is 1. Now we don't have just s1 and b1, but a product of them. This means for every point on the circle s1, you attach a line b1 so that the result is a geometric object again. In this case, we get a cylinder. In fact, this works in the other direction as well. You can attach a circle at every point of the line and get the same object. What we are going to show is that they both have the same surface area. But first, a second example. The simplest of these relations is between S1 and the product of S1 and B0. B0 is just a single point which makes this trivial. Attaching a circle at every point of the point gives you a two-dimensional cylinder which is just a circle. That the circle and the circle have the same boundary is obvious. Now going back, what is the surface area of the cylinder? Unlike for example the surface of the sphere is 2, its surface is only curved in one dimension. We define the cylinder as a product of a line and a circle. So unrolling the circle gives a non-curved surface and we can calculate its area. It's the volume of the ball, which is the length of the line, times the surface of the unrolled circle, which is its circumference. And the general formula is Sn is b n-1 times 2 pi r. The last thing would be proving this equality and for this let me outline how you do it in three dimensions. A sphere has the same surface area as the mantle of a cylinder surrounding it. There is a very beautiful proof by Archimedes and it goes like this. Draw a latitude longitude grid on the sphere. Now pick one cell in this grid. Imagine that the z-axis emits light, so this cell casts a shadow onto the cylinder. The area of the shadow roughly approximates the area of the cell you chose. And the finer the grid is, the more accurate. I won't go too much into the details here. You can find them in this video by Freebrook and Brown, link in description. In fact, this method works in all dimensions. Though instead of having one z-axis, you have either no z-axis as in two dimensions, or multiple axes perpendicular to the x-y plane. It's finally coming together now. We got two formulas, one relating Sn-1 with Bn and one relating Sn with Bn-1. To get a complete recursion formula, we need to specify these values for two values of n. These will be our starting points. 
Let's choose the area of the circle, b2, which is pi times r squared, and the length of a line from minus r to r, b1, is 2 times r. Try these formulas out, maybe calculate s1, or s2, or b3. If we now want to calculate bn for an arbitrary dimension n, we need to use both the recursion formulas to get to one of our starting points. You already calculated b3, but could you also calculate b4, b5, etc. using the same techniques? Now it's your turn. Find a general formula for bn. Maybe try to first derive a recursive formula that directly relates bn to bn plus 2 without the need for the s's. So, combining our two recursive formulas, we can get a relation between bn and bn plus 2. So we could also express bn plus 4 in terms of bn. I've already written it in a kind of suggestive way, because if you do the same thing again and express bn plus 6 in terms of bn, you can probably already see the pattern. Now let me generalize this formula and also rewrite it a bit and maybe you can already see where the half factorial will come into play. This could look a bit intimidating, but let's focus on the part in parentheses, as this is the important one. We have two starting values for n, where we know the value bn, 1 and 2. Let's take a look at n equals 2 first. We get k halves plus 1 factorial. If we instead set n to 1, we get something extremely similar. Now we discussed earlier that for any x, x factorial would be x times x minus 1 factorial. Therefore, k halves plus 1 half factorial would be k halves plus 1 half times k halves minus 1 half factorial, and so on until you get almost the exact formula we want. And finally, we can rewrite the equation one more time, because now we can insert this back into our original formula. Substituting 2 plus k for n in the first formula, and in the second one, 1 plus k for n, gives almost identical expressions, one for even values of n, the other for odd values of n. The only difference between the two is that we got this crazy expression involving one half factorial in the second expression. But if we just define it to be one, both formulas are identical, we found a general formula for volumes of hyperspheres and, most importantly, we defined the half factorial with a meaningful value. So, one half factorial times two divided by pi to the half, which is the square root of pi, is now one. And therefore, one half factorial is the square root of pi over two. No gamma function involved. Using our identity from earlier, we get the beautiful result of minus 1 factorial equals the square root of pi. And the complete formula for volumes of hyperspheres without distinction between even and odd values of n. So what did I want to show you? Of course, the beautiful derivation of the half factorial. But this was a lot more about the journey than the result. The gamma function is already the generalization of the factorial. Hopefully, you could learn something new about problem solving and the necessary shift in perspective it sometimes takes. If you have feedback, write me a comment and now you should watch this video.